I am The Animist, and you're watching the Video and Company Podcast, the podcast where we talk about running a video production business. Today we have Matt Tyndall from Priceless Misc. His story of developing this company over the past 10 years is pretty inspirational and works with some of the biggest agencies here in Charlotte. Matt and I actually met through the podcast, Shouts Out Andrew, for introducing us unknowingly. And Matt's just an awesome guy, and I love his company, and I love what he does. So without further ado, here is Matt Tyndall. So like Priceless Myths started kind of as, as an evolution of something we did before, which what we did before was CLT Blog, which if you've been around Charlotte a little bit longer than like 2012, you probably know of it because we started in 2008 and then we were the largest like online only news outlet so we were kicking everybody's butt in town as far as like social media goes and like facebook and all that kind of stuff like the local news stations had like a couple hundred people following them on twitter and facebook and mm-hmm. we had thousands yeah so we were able to get a lot of people like viewing our content and we had like a big network of contributors and producers and all this kind of stuff that would cover anything and everything around Charlotte. So if you imagine like a Charlotte agenda more maybe like policy focused. So we had stuff with the government center and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's how most people knew us. And then from there we had a big following and people were like, Hey, can you do this website for us? Which is what our original roots were, was doing web stuff. Um, and then we started doing more video stuff to differentiate ourselves on the web because nobody was doing video then. So we were like, let's do some video. And then it evolved to like, hey, can you do some websites to, hey, can you do some video? And so we didn't know really what to do besides incorporating like a consulting company, which mm-hmm. is what we called it then. And that's when Priceless came out. And that was like 2008-ish still. Yeah. And we used that as a parent company. And then around 2010, we teamed up with WTVI, the local PBS station. And they offered us basically like space and like mentorship stuff because they were also working in the journalism space and we teamed up for the night news challenge because the year before we were in the top 10 for the night news challenge and had a chance to almost win like a million dollars to do some stuff we wanted to do for citizen journalism with CLT blog. So that next year WTVI was like, Hey, you guys went far, let's joint do a joint application. And then we became buddies up there and ended up having office space up there, studio space, used all this equipment that wasn't getting used because around 2010 is right, you know, as the recession was like dropping Mm -hmm. and WTVI had nothing going on because they lost all this funding from the recession that the county was going to give them. And they were kind of just like an empty building. They were doing a couple of cool things here and there, but for the most part, you know, the studio, which is the biggest studio between DC and, and like Orlando at the time was just sitting empty. So we ended up running like TV shows for um, CLT blog. We had like three or four different type TV shows, like set shows that we were uh-huh. doing. So this is where Justin and I, my business partner, ended up like leveling up really quickly. And we were young, smart, whatever BS people there compared to a bunch of people that were older. So we had all these crazy concepts and then they started us wanting to do like some commercials for clients and this and this and this. So we ended up just like getting like a two year apprenticeship program with like people who've been in the business for 40 years, yeah. showing us what to do and had access to all this equipment that you don't get access to in a 10,000 square foot studio, you don't get access to by being a newbie. And so from there, it kind of evolved into more like consulting after now that we had a body of work and some cameras and stuff that we could rent. We just kind of kept going and going and going and you know, every year we grow you didn't go out being like, this is what we're going to do. There was just like an opportunity there. Yeah. And you just like took full strength. Well, Justin and I met in a Chinese class and both like web stuff and just nerded out on stuff that we like doing. And eventually people wanted to pay us for what we were passionate about. Yeah. And we had always had a philosophy and probably still do just to like never say no. Yeah. So we've always had like big projects like, Hey, can you do this? Like, yeah, no problem. And then we hang up the phone and we're like, holy shit. Like, what are we going to do? Yeah. <laughs> and then we figure it out. I mean, we did this way back in the day. It had to be like 2011. We did this opera in Portland, Oregon that like a friend of a friend connected us to. And at the time it was like a $40,000 budget, which was the biggest budget we've ever had. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we got off the phone and we're like, I don't know how we're going to do this, but let's just figure it out. So we had to like fly out to Portland, shoot this over two days and like give them something and cut like a three hour opera together, which is way different than cutting other stuff. 
Um, but we did it. We got paid. Everybody was happy. And now we knew how to do that. And we learned a lot. And we just kept on kind of growing and moving. So did you have like a video background during the whole web stuff? Or was it something you just like? We just did it. I mean, it would be what vlogging is today. Yeah. You know, we just got, I had an old, what was it? A Canon 7D because somebody ended up kicking in our like our house's door one day and stole my old like rebel yeah so i ended up having like a big insurance claim because they stole all this like they stole my laptop they stole all this stuff and i was like oh cool we can get this 7d which can do video this is right at the time the 5d was like you know revving up mm -hmm. and so we had a cool camera to do stuff and we had a platform that people wanted to watch stuff on nobody else was doing video so we just kind of taught ourselves and another big thing we ended up doing a lot of was like live streaming yeah. Because nobody was doing live streaming, we were able to like broadcast from all this news journalism stuff and that kind of like leveled us up too of like being able to live stream. That wasn't like around the time of I can't remember the name. It was Al Gore's company. It was like user generated content, it was on cable. Do you remember this? Mm -mm. It now is Al Jazeera. Or okay. Al Jazeera bought it. Current T V. Okay, Do you remember current, that? yeah, yeah. We had a lot of influence from like current like current, I don't even remember a lot of the stuff. Current a Gothamist, about that. a bunch of old stuff that yeah. like was there. So, but yeah, I mean, it, it spawned from like blogging. Blogging, that's what the, the height of blogging. And we said, how do we just make it different like, by adding more photos and videos? Yeah. And doing it at a local level. But now like you're doing a completely different yeah, thing. Yeah, we phased out CLT blog after the 2012, or yeah, 2012 DNC. Cause we, also during then, we had a very ambitious project called The People where we had a space in Uptown that uh, accommodated a thousand independent media and bloggers and all that kind of stuff. Because at that time, the DNC wasn't accrediting a lot of people or it was really hard to be accredited as, at the DNC itself. And um, we wanted a space for other people to come. If you were just a little blogger, you could have a desk, do all this stuff. So we had a co-working space, basically. Then we had an event space where we were bringing in senators, Congress people, policy makers, anything and everything and running basically like 15 hours of content each day of the convention where people could have a press conference and talk to all these bloggers. So we were running a parallel track to the DNC for people who weren't as accredited, but we ended up having highly accredited people. Um, Twitter was based out of our space and gave us like a big donation or like sponsorship. Eventbrite was sponsored out of our space. Live, uh, no, it was, was it live stream? I have to double check. I don't know. Mm, it was either live stream or the other one was taking our feed because we recorded everything and had it live, yeah. was taking it on, putting it live on their site and it had like 30, 40,000 people watching it all day, every day. Um, PBS came out of our space, was doing a lot of stuff. I mean, like, some of the names and stuff we had up there is like crazy. Um, and then the other thing we did in those mornings on that space is that we had the show Democracy Now, which is like syndicated I know about that. everywhere. Yeah. yeah, they broadcast out of our space every morning for two hours, which helps fund all this. Nation, other. for like the nationwide, nationwide broadcast? Yeah, that, that, their DNC stuff was at, based out of oh, our location. DNC. Okay, that's wild. So, I mean, which was the same, ho you know, like the main host. Um, but that took up all our time. We weren't able to do CLT blog. So that was about the time we spun down CLT blog and went hard into consulting or agency stuff mm -hmm. because we just needed money because we didn't make any money for like a whole year. You've done like commercial stuff mm -hmm. broadcast like with the Belk Bowl and that whole thing. But you've, I've also seen you do like um, those documentary things that like ESPN or college places would do. So like you've got a huge client list. Yeah. But what would you say like your niche type of content is? I mean, I think that's a it's tough because just going with the philosophy of not, not saying no, I want to try everything and see what I like. Where we end up focusing on a lot that I think we do best at is documentary-ish type stuff. But like the merging between video and web is when we can do a cool website like we did for Belk. We made this whole like submission website, did all this kind of stuff, and then did all this video content that lives on the web. Plus with some like video ad marketing and all this kind of PPC type stuff. Like that's our perfect project is when we can blend like full cycle. Yeah, storytelling and web stuff and like tell a whole story. Cause like one thing I say a lot is there's multiple ways to tell a story. So if I was teaching you how to bake something, sometimes it's better to read a recipe. Sometimes it's better to see a picture of something. And sometimes it's better to watch somebody like do the dough and do some of that stuff. So 
that's the kind of storytelling I like is when you can do mixed media and tell something bigger and better than you could with each individual piece. Who would you say like are some of the biggest clients that you've worked so with? So we work with agencies in town that work with big clients. So that's kind of where we interface. But like we've worked with Navy Federal Credit Union. We've worked with, um, hold on. We're with Navy Federal Credit Union, Academy Sports. Um, we're going down to the Bassmaster Classic. We just did some stuff for the Belk Bowl. I mean, I, I, I could probably pull up on my phone. Do you have new people coming in a lot or is it pretty much like a base that you? Most of the time now is like where our business strategy is going forward is how do we team up with more agencies? Because I don't want to do the selling. I don't want to hire sales rep and do all that kind of stuff to go hunt for business. I'd rather be that key partner that works with an agency where they know these are the best video guys in town. Because mm -hmm. we've always come from the philosophy of way back from CLT blog of thinking like everybody's good at what they do, like what they love doing. So I'd much rather hire a freelancer who's the best motion graphics person or the best audio person or the best 3D designer because I don't think those people live in agencies. I think a lot of times, I think, I think some people live in agencies, but I think the best and the brightest kind of want to do it themselves. And if they're that good, they can charge enough of a premium to live by themselves and run their own schedule, right. uh, which is kind of something we've learned from like software stuff. Like the best iOS developers don't work for X, Y, and Z. They, they work for themselves and these big companies hire them in. Yeah. Which is the same way that I built out my company. Like we have a really small team, but I have like a, you know, great shooters, great audio guys, great editors and all that kind of stuff that I source out because they're freelancers. Um, and that's how the industry is a little bit, but I think you get the best and bright people. And that's how I want agencies to look at us to say, well, instead of us keeping a whole video crew here and we do this much video or this much video, you know, I'd much rather hire these guys that do nothing but video and they, they have to make good video to keep surviving. Yeah instead of people who are complacent on a salary, maybe. Well, and usually it's more price efficient for them, usually. Sometimes, yeah, it matters what how much content they have coming through. Well, like the purpose of this whole season, mm -hmm. I don't know why I keep calling it that, but um, <laughs> is it's agency focused, because I did a little survey. All the listeners pretty much like sent me like what they're most interested in. And the two things that kept popping up the most or three things mm -hmm. is like huge sets, like the kind of sets that like, you know, there's like 50 people working yeah. on or 20 people, um, agency work and what a producer does. So I've mm -hmm. got the producer taken care of, but I figured who better to talk about agency stuff than you yeah. because you deal with them so often. Yeah. So, I mean, for like agency stuff, you know, it's going out, finding the right context. I mean, the way that I met our two biggest agencies that we work with is kind of happenstance. Yeah. Like I met one of them through Huga when we had a co-working space over there. They came over and needed some random graphic design work. And then the other um, one um, is basically because we shared office space with them at a co-working space again. Yeah. So like, but what I would say is that I knew they didn't do video and then I made it a point for them to know what we did and kind of going along the mindset of just never saying no. So like, can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? Absolutely. No problem. And at this point we knew the skills, but I was pushing hard to show, like show off for them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I get calls from a couple of these agencies all the time and I'm on 24 seven because they make up the majority of our business, but they also know they can rely on me if they need something quick or they want to come up with an idea. So the great thing is, is that we've been able, they've been able to outsource most of their creative work just to us. And we're like an outside creative agency for them yeah. and they just sell it to the client. I don't think I sold to people like, Hey, check out my stuff. Yeah. I was just Matt and I was trying to be a good guy and help them out and figure out what their problems were and mm -hmm. see how we can solve them instead of being like, look at my portfolio. Look how great this is. Yeah. Don't you want to buy something from here? The co-working space that y'all all met at, it was, it was Huga, right? I think. Well, it was, story. it ended up being Huga. It, ended up being it, it was something else before. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've always thought that being at a co-working space, even though I was only there for about like six months, it's huge for my business development mm -hmm. because it put me in a place where I was networking constantly Yeah, and kind of like just was around people that when they saw my work, they like talked about it and they would like, they made me, it's one thing for me to hear from my family and my friends like, oh, your stuff's cool. But like when yeah. you hear from other business people, I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm still doing something right. Yeah. I think that's, I mean, and not just they think it's cool, but they want it. 
I think is the yeah. biggest thing. And they'll like, pay for it, yeah. Yeah, because I think a lot of time in Charlotte, we have a what I call the bless your heart mentality that somebody will say, oh, your video was awesome, and then turn around and be like, look at that piece of shit. Yeah. And nobody's, like, honest around here. Yeah. So you got to balance that by having, like, a good peer, like, group that tells you it's good. And yeah. then also having clients that, like, well, they keep coming back. How do I keep them happy? So. Yeah. Um, which, you know, has led us to go do stuff all around the country with like some of the brands I was telling you about, like Academy Sports and Navy Federal and Belk. Yeah. Um, to like doing stuff locally, but like bigger crews than we had there. Like we did stuff for a air conditioning company that like I had like a 30 person crew, you know, full, you know, full dolly, full um, um, steady cam ops, like gaffer, you know, when, when I know when I have to hire craft services and pay them like X number of dollars a yeah. day, I'm doing something right when the budget's like $100,000 for a commercial. You know, that's fun. Um, but that's not what we do a lot. So, I mean, it's a mix of, of that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I mean, something that I do tell the listeners and like friends of mine that are like maybe a couple years behind me, a lot of the things I tell them is like, the way I get work is by working. Yeah. it's like. If I do something for these people, it'll end up being more work. So I just try to stay busy. Well, it's that tough thing of like, you don't do stuff for exposure. You got to know your value, yeah. but you also got to know when there's good opportunities to take to like show off and do stuff for people. Yeah. I mean, the first stuff I did for the biggest agency we work with was like doing a grand opening of a store, which is like, I don't want to do that. Yeah. But like, I was able to prove to him, be like, look how cool this is. Look how cool this is. And then keep moving up the chain to the point where they're like, oh, help us sell more stuff to these people. Yeah. So, you know, if I was the pure, like never do anything below your rate kind of thing, which a lot of people preach and I think is valuable, I would have never had that opportunity. It's funny because you keep talking about your motto is never say no. And you actually introduced me that book where it was pretty much like nine chapters of how to say no. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. And I've been still harping on it. Yeah. I mean, it's like a mix of like, you gotta have a work-life balance. Yeah. And I, and I've gone through a lot of stuff where there wasn't work life or where me and my business partner didn't have a salary and we were living in the same house and figuring all this out. So it's all about a balance. But I think a lot of people can get in their own way and say no, because yeah. like the value this or, oh, I don't know. The imposter syndrome is one thing. And like, yeah. that's where I kind of say is like, I don't want to lie to people, but I don't want to have imposter syndrome either where I'm like, well, I can't do that. It's like, no, I can figure it out. Yeah. And we're going to figure it out. We got enough time. Like I have just enough time to figure how out how to do this. And it turns out, and you like, it's a trial by fire meth, you know, yeah. methodology. Some people will see me film a podcast for a client. And I have a couple clients where it's like, whatever they need me to do, I got them because they've been with me for like three or four years. Yeah. They like pay my bills. Um, but people are like, oh, can you do that for me? And I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that for you because, yeah. because of the cost or just varying things. And then I realized what I've kind of been doing to get me to the commercial area is I would start off doing something small like that for someone and then we'd be able to lead up into doing something fancier. See, I, and I feel mixed about that. Like I have my clients that have been clients for a while and I go above and beyond and build them smaller, Yeah. you know, and there's like, oh, well, you guys are getting a great value. But then it also stresses, like we've had stress with some of those clients because if I'm making this much on this stuff and spending, you know, the same amount of time, but I'm making this much on that other one, like, it's really hard for me to take it seriously. It's something I have to reconcile with. They yeah. either let them go or just be okay with doing what now is this this level work of money for this price. Um, so that's something I have to rectify. But the other thing is, too, is that I strongly believe there are companies that you can come in and talk to. And if you give them a deal, let's just say they want to do a $100,000 commercial. But they're like, oh, we'll bring you in for a $5,000 little little web thing first you're always going to be their five thousand dollar web guy yeah because once they have the hundred thousand dollar budget to do the big thing they're going to go find the hundred thousand dollar video house mm -hmm. so that's something i've like been cognizant of of if i do something for somebody cheap i give them a full invoice like this is how much it was and because we're buddies or i'm doing this for first you know for you i'm taking 70 percent off and they can see that number so the five thousand dollar shoot might have really been a twenty thousand dollar shoot that I show them on the invoice and show a discount. Yeah. So now I'm still the $20,000 person that did it for a favor. And next time they ask for it or they ask for a revision or this or that, I'm like, well, this is the rate. You got it in the invoice. You shouldn't be surprised. It's a it's a definite tightrope. And I've heard that exact advice before, but I feel like it hasn't been like pushed 
into the community a little more. So I'm glad that you said. Yeah, that. I mean, there's always people undercutting and all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, the like line item thing. So oh yeah, just, 100% all yeah. the time. I mean, everybody I've told that to, and they've done it. They're like, oh, my life's so much better when it because it's mostly like nonprofits that end up bleeding you dry like that. Because they're like, well, this was five thousand. Can't you do it for this much? And that's something me and my business partners talked about. Is that like. Either we're getting paid like a crap ton for something and it's worth it that way, or if we're doing something for free, is it something that we can add to the portfolio? Yeah. That makes or there's it worth some it. other benefit. Yeah. And like and I also have the sliding scale of like however much of a deal I'm cutting to you, I get that much in creative control. So, you know, if you want me to do a twenty thousand dollar video for you for ten thousand, the amount of creative control that I have on that is a lot more than you pay me my retail. That's rate. what I'm doing right now with uh, music videos because it's like I'm just trying to up the scale on that and the artist will always be broke yeah um unless i'm doing like direct label work which is still pain but it's like it's i just find it easier where i can like come down a little bit in price but just like i'm going to be running creative totally because then you can you know then you don't have that bad, bad ideas and you're not getting paid a lot and it's something you're not proud of that you don't put on your portfolio yeah. so you wasted time um and so there was something else i wanted to talk about where and i've noticed this where like priceless on social um, isn't as popping as like your personal brand, which I don't know if you call it personal brand, yeah. but it's your personal Instagram. I mean, that's something Justin and I struggle with. We've talked about it. It's like, yeah. we're both the proprietors of the company. So ours should be good and we should live our lives through that. Right. But we also want our brand one to be good, but it's just tough. Mm -hmm. Cause like, if I'm out on set, I'm going to post something on mine or us out, you know, skiing or something like that with the crew. I post it online and try to repost it there, but it's just like one more layer. Because I, mean, I don't think do you hide behind the company, and I don't want to use hide as like a bad word. Mm, like, like how the, so? Like the work that you do, like the pride in that work. Like, is do you give it all to the company, or do you like be like, oh yeah, I was part of that? Oh, it's all to the. I mean, like my biggest thing, and anybody tells you is like, they're like, what do you do? I was like, well, I just produce. Like, I hire people and take all the credit for it. So like, I don't have much talent in that kind of stuff. And the other thing is too. And I think is a fortunate trait is that like I hate everything we do like I look at something I'm like man it could have been a lot better if we did this or this or this yeah and like one of my favorite lines is you know some the, somebody talked to a painter like well what do you do with all your paintings after you're done with them and he's like well I stare at them till I hate them and I think that's everything like every we've done some good videos and I like some of the stuff but we can always do it better yeah and I don't ever want to be like look how great that one thing was like everything can be improved on yeah. so I give credit to my crew when we do something good and everything bad is me so like that's kind of how I do it yeah like, I don't even want to praise like price is missed because it's like the crew that did a lot of this stuff and I want to get them the recognition true so like are you pretty much would you consider yourself a producer role at this point I guess I mean I wear a lot of hats so yeah some days producing some days direct and some days just being an executive producer some guy sometimes just doing payroll sometimes editing like i'd say most of my talent lies in editing but i barely ever edit anymore yeah. i have a good i think justin and i both have a good eye of seeing what's good mm -hmm. and telling people how to make it better which is like kind of our biggest asset yeah is like like is identifying quality and I've noticed that like a lot of the like creative people that like start out doing freelance, even though like that's different than what you started out doing is that like people that start out doing freelance or they're in the position I'm at, when they do eventually build the company, the production company, they s tend to slowly turn into like creative directors and like producers. Yeah. And they're like not camera hopping or like lighting or, you know, doing yeah. all that stuff. They're all like, you know. Well, I'd rather hire a better camera op than I, because I know I'm not good at that. I know I'm not good at lighting. I know I'm not good at audio or this or that. Yeah. So let me hire better people to come do that and it raises all boats and I can, you know, yeah. bill out more and the quality is better. Okay. Um, I mean, it's a tough, I mean, coming in knowing that I'm not the best photographer or videographer, I think helped. Yeah. I mean, like I have a history degree. I have no, like, no background in this besides just doing it. I feel like you do business extremely well. Obviously, like you've got a good track record and portfolio and all that stuff to like back it all up. And like kind of, I guess why I'm doing this is because I'm obviously I'm interested in like the, the aesthetics. Like yeah. I'm not really techie, so I don't like drool over cameras. Like it was nice when I got the Earth Mini because I could stop looking. Like yeah. I don't care anymore. It's like, I got it, it's fine. No, I'm a tech head, so. But like, I'm all about like how 
you get, achieve a look and how to yeah. like up your quality kind of thing within um, those parameters. But at the other time, at the other side, I'm super into business now, and I think it was just from like binging on Gary Vee for about like three years because I started listening to him when I was it was 2015. I was doing advertising for a nicotine company full time, and I found him. Was listening to his stuff. I was like, yeah, yeah, I think I can start a business. And then the company went under. Yeah. So I had to go freelance because that's all I had. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to go back to like working at a grocery store. Yeah. Um, and so like I had that fire, and I also had that inspiration and that business mindset from you know being influenced by that. So what would you say like to the people that are artistic based, and a lot of them are like, oh yeah, there's you know the art and the business and it's separate. I don't really think that's true because I feel like people like us. I, don't, I mean, I don't know how I got to it. I mean, my family had some, like, entrepreneurship. My dad owned his own body shop, mm -hmm. you know, so it's nothing like what I'm doing, but it's like, oh, maybe I saw somebody saying, like, oh, they can be their own boss. Yeah. And that made it easy for me. Like, I've never had, like, a real job. Yeah. I mean, I worked in college. I was an RA in college. I worked at, like, a residence hall, and I worked at Best Buy because mm -hmm. I'm a tech head. You know, like, I love all that stuff. But, like, and then I went from, like, Best Buy to making a little bit of money doing freelancey stuff as priceless and then we made priceless my full-time job so like this is the only salary real job i've ever had is the ones i made for myself yeah um so i don't know like to me there wasn't a decision point it could have been like, the conditioning it, i mean i think i also come from like privilege of like hey i had parents who i knew if i messed something up so bad that they can help me pay for rent or i'm not going to go hungry or this or that so like I think that makes it easier just to be like, well, I'll just see what happens. Yeah. You know. I mean, there's definitely been times where we've had like no money in the bank, <laughs> you know, or owed people money and like gone up and down and all that kind of stuff. So there's like the stresses of it, but like I didn't have a decision point of like I'm going to start a business. Yeah. It just kind of I stumbled into it. Like my plan was to get a history degree and an international studies degree and go into the state department. Then I met my buddy and we just kind of people just kept giving us money to do stuff so we we're like let's just keep leaning into it till people stop giving us money yeah so i mean it's tough to say but i think like on the business side you know what i tell a lot of people early on like interns and stuff that we get is like know what your day rate know what your rate is know what your hourly rate is so if it's x number of dollars an hour don't do anything for less than that or if you do, make sure you're getting a value on the other side equal to that. And so I think once people realize like, oh, I'm worth X number of dollars, 10, 20, $50 an hour, $100 an hour, it shapes their thinking with the art. So like, why are you doing this art if it's not worth, if somebody could pay you that much to do it, either you gotta choose the art side or like take some money, but the money helps facilitate some of the other art stuff. I had a conversation with a local AC where, you know, he was talking to a younger guy and they're like, oh man, I just, I'm just in it for the art. And he had to be like, listen, it's, it's about the bread. Like you gotta get the bag. Yeah. And I can appreciate that so much, especially when the Unless person's Unless your family has that. a shit ton of money or you got a significant other that's paying for everything. Yeah. Then you can do art as much as you want, but you know, can't and, eat paintings, you can't eat video. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because my dad um, runs, he's like an accountant. Yeah. He's got like his own office that was, he bought from my grandfather, like not the same bloodline, yeah. he, his father-in-law. And so like, I grew up just seeing him working for himself. So like, it only made sense. Like if I had gotten a regular desk job, it would have been more irregular to like my viewpoint yeah. of the world. Kind well, of. And if your family does nothing but nine to five jobs and works for somebody, that seems like the normal path to go. Yeah. Um, but we're also in a new economy too, where like everybody's their own boss. Yeah. So I, I mean, it's a weird thing. <laughs> like I like I don't know everybody's their own boss but you need to make sure you take care of yourself and like set goals and yeah try to exceed them and all that kind of stuff it's one thing for me to be like oh I've been running a business for about like four to five years but it's like it's been a good economy in that time yeah. like I don't know anybody that like started 2008 9 or 10 and like yeah. are still doing it today because it's like that was rough well luckily like when Justin and I started in like 2007 and 8 we were just 20 something so you could you know stay in the same house over in wesley heights and maybe be late for rent before we got kicked out you know we could able we were able to like live lean and eat ramen and do all that kind of stuff so we were able to weather that but i can only imagine people on the other side yeah you know who just had to lose all the stuff and what blows my mind is when all these freelancers don't see themselves as a business 
like I've had all kinds of people who shoot and edit and do all this stuff and they're like oh I got this cool gig but like I'm not a business so can Priceless do it and you just hire me and I'm like what are you talking about like there's no difference between what Justin and I were doing now or even back then compared to anybody who's freelance yeah you know like we were just two guys doing it but we just branded it as a business and somehow added like some legitimacy to it I've been freelancing since 2014 Mm -hmm. I had, you know, pseudonyms and, and yeah. names to go under, but like the animus, like the company was not fully formed legally until like last year. Yeah. And I was just filing taxes like under my name. And stuff. Yeah. But it was like, I was, I always considered me running a business. And then, you know, as I'm like reading and listening to all these like entrepreneurs and, you know, consultants and stuff like that, they're like talking about freelance and business. And I'm like, why is there such a blurry line? There's I don't think there's a line at all. No, it's the same thing. I mean... I, but I have people who work for me who are, you know, camera ops and all that stuff. They all have their own business that they do taxes on, but they don't see themselves as the whole thing. And yeah. I don't know why if like if they get a gig, they bring it to me and then I hire them and you know, we can do profit share and do all that yeah. kind of stuff. But like it blew my mind when somebody was like, I don't even want to deal with all that stuff. I was like, What that's the easy fun part. Like Yeah. Like once you have it, you have it. Like sales is sales is hard and I don't yeah. I totally am with you with like not wanting to be a part of it and it just like coming there yeah but like that's the process I'm in now where it's like not that I'm going out and getting getting work but it's more or less like negotiating it where like I have people that come to me and they're like I 100% want to work with you or yeah. at least like I 80% want to work with you 20% yeah. on the fence what I'm trying to figure out is how to like get that price to where I want it to be and the project to where I want it to be and then close yeah, because I mean, people can come to me and tell me exactly how much they got to spend, but it's like that might not be worth it at all. Yeah, I mean, I and that's how I attack most people with stuff. They're like, "How much will you do this for?" It's like, "How much will you pay?" Because like then we can scale up. I mean, videos like building a house. Like, do you want real hardwoods or do you want laminate? Like, yeah. we can figure out wherever your budget is. Um, but like, yeah, it just blows my mind that people don't like because the closer you are to the idea the more you get a charge. Yeah. So like if you were gaffing on a commercial, you're making your day rate. If I'm DPing or something like that, and you're coming up with some of the concepts, or sorry, so say you're just a camera guy, you're getting your day rate. You're a DP, you're coming up with some of the vision, so you're getting paid a little bit more. You're a creative director, you're coming up with the bigger vision, you get paid more for that. You're the agency that runs that. You get a pay, you know, you get paid right. way above what everybody else is, you know, you can. Yeah, like what is the idea worth for client A? It could be a hundred thousand dollar thing and you can only, who knows how much it is to execute it, but the value is still there. Right. And if you do value based pricing and not just, oh, it cost me $5,000 to do this. I'm going to charge you 7,000. But if they're going to make a million dollars off that idea, you want a part of that too. Yeah. And I've talked about value based pricing before on the show, um, but not on the video version. Could you like just briefly like define what that means to you? Like I mean, value-based what, pricing? What I know about value-based pricing is kind of coming down to if you're selling a widget for a company, yeah. how much do they have to make by that widget? So like as long as you charge a dollar less than that or whatever, it's a good value for them because they made money. I think any type of investment or ROI, you know, you're willing to spend up to the amount where you're losing money to do it. You know, of course you want to make 2X, 3X, 4X or yeah. whatever. But value-based pricing, if, if somebody's gonna make a million dollars off of a commercial that I shoot, I'm not gonna charge them $10,000 for it, you know, because we're bringing a lot of value to bring it, you know, to market and for them to make that million dollars. So you kind of have to peg your pricing based on what the outlet's gonna be. And there's probably a floor you could set too, because you know how much it's gonna cost them to actually make something good. So I don't know if that was a good explanation or not. Well, I mean, pretty much like it's, if they're gonna if they're gonna make more money off of it, then it's worth more to them. Yeah, it's you got to know how much it costs. You got to know how much it's worth for the client to kind of gauge on what you, you want to do. Yeah, and sometimes they won't tell you. You know, we were working with this one client, and you know, I'm sure they had a multi million dollar contract with this thing that they were airing it on, mm -hmm. and like I brought like a pretty aggressive price to it, but I'm sure like what they're making off of is up here and what I'm making up here and I had a lot of room to go, but I was also happy with the number I put yeah. too. Well, and a big thing I've learned and it's like, it's kind of dangerous because once it happens, like you realize like it can become a pattern, which is a good thing most of the time is where um, like you price high 
Yeah. Maybe even if you price high for the first time. But what I'm saying is like, because I've priced high before and never gotten it. But that one time where you price high and you get it, you go, well, that was easy. You don't want to, I mean, like, I don't want to go and say like, oh, we price high on stuff. We price right. for the value. But at the same time, you don't want to, but you, you don't want to be the 5,000, like what I was saying before. Yeah. You want to be the $100,000 com commercial company or the million dollar commercial company and not the $10,000 commercial company. Right. Because like, even if you, you know, you say to do this commercial is going to cost $100,000 and you're like, wow, that's way too high. Yeah. Like, okay, cool. Like, what did you, you didn't lose anything on it. And now if they ever get to that level, they know that you're the guy who's already ready for it mm -hmm. instead of the guy that they're building up at the $10,000. Right. Level. So, you know, price fairly price, you know, your idea is worth a lot more than just the crew. And I think that's where you can kind of multiply your kind of margins on it. Yeah. But you know, like if somebody calls up and they're like, Hey, I got the script wrote out. I just need a crew and this and this and this, like my level of like making money on it is a lot smaller than let me come up with this commercial idea or this campaign idea and then execute on it. Because that's really what they're paying for is your idea to come up with something good. Because I used to just charge for like the work. Yeah. Which was what I actually didn't even consider it work back then. The work was pretty much the shoot and the edit. Yeah. Um, and now it's like I'm making pitch decks, lookbooks, like shot lists, like three or four phone calls, cup of coffee just to get like the idea solid. And the only reason I did that was so that when I would get to shoot, I'm you, not thinking, oh, yeah. what do we gotta do? Like, and the quality is raised yeah, because you already paper. know what you're doing. Exactly. But you can't just, I mean, they gotta I, charge. I gotta charge for that now. Well, you're not just charging hourly too, because like every time you do it, you're flexing that muscle or you're working that muscle. So now you're way better at that stuff than somebody just starting. So the value of you doing it in a short amount of time is better than somebody spending a lot of time. Like yeah. one biggest thing that like irks me is that like you can always get undercut by people you know we might have a fifty thousand dollar commercial we want to do and somebody can come in and they could work their butt off and be really good shooters and all that kind of stuff and make something as good at a tenth of the price let's just say or you know like ten thousand dollars but the amount of time that it takes them to get to that point is going to always be larger than ours so we had a commercial where we were shooting like two commercials in a day with a full 30 person crew and all this kind of stuff. And if everything didn't go right, you know, we'd had to go into another day and we're spending like $8,000 right. in actors. And we're like, my crew itself is tens of thousands of dollars to write, you know, and we couldn't go to a second day. So if you have somebody who's inexperienced, don't know what they're doing, you, they couldn't execute the same way we did. They, you couldn't get that amount of stuff. You, you just couldn't drop somebody in there to do it without having the experience to know like what to expect, you know, what gear I need to have, how many people do I need and this and that and that. Like every hour that goes by, like that's money paid. Mm -hmm. that's I mean, like and that's the same thing with burned. big movies look like, you know, like yeah. why do you spend, you know, a hundred plus thousand dollars on a, you know, an RELF camera because you know, it's a hundred percent rock status, yeah. rock, you know, rock solid and you're not shooting it on you know, whatever other uh, Kenfinity ca camera. Yeah, it can match it and it looks really good, but like, or back in the day with reds, like you'd have to have a second red back to, you yeah. know, ready to go because if that thing powers down for an hour, what is an hour of crew cost? What is an hour of talent cost or location? Like a hundred thousand dollars for a camera is a drop in the bucket compared to what you could be losing if you have somebody expensive on set. Yeah. I mean, exactly. we had one actor on set one time that costs you know, tens of thousands of dollars for the day. Like their price of what they were getting paid for that day was more than a lot of other productions I've done. <laughs> so like, all right, everything needs to be working, working perfectly and all that kind of stuff. And that was the same shoot that we had like a 48 hour notice before we needed to shoot with them in another state doing all this kind of stuff that if you're just a, if you don't have the talent or you don't have the muscles kind of trained for that, then you're just going to fail. We covered a lot yeah. in a short amount That's of time, whatever. but it was like so perfect. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, usually at the end, people say if they have something going on or something they want to like premiere or like, you know, send some traffic to. You know, I'm just, just working. But I mean, if anybody, like the biggest thing we like doing is like helping people connect in town or if you have any questions, like I love building people up and doing all that stuff. So. Like hit me up on Instagram on Priceless Misc or my personal at MR Tyndall yeah. on Instagram or anything like that. Just hit me up. Okay. And like, I love just connecting people and making the community stronger and 
like teaching people stuff. Perfect. That's so. exactly what we need. All right. Yep. Appreciate it. Man. I got that merch. You can go, you know, slam that subscribe button. I don't know. Do all that, <laughs> that YouTube stuff. <laughs>